Uh, Y'all stay with us if we can get our work to church today. Two verses from this past week, one in Luke, but, uh, two in Philippians. Uh, we're just going to do it volunteer side, which we always do. Say a verse if you'd like to, if you'd recite it, if you practiced at home, if you think you're confident enough to say it, um, raise your hand. I'll come bring you the, the mic. Who would like to say Luke 12, 15?
Grazie. Next one, Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Philippians 4, 6, and 7. When I, I had surgery and, on my leg and I was like kind of bedridden for like a little bit, my mom would take this verse. She takes it up on, on a mirror. So I don't think I can forget this verse if I try to. And she wants to say it. Yes. Don't be anxious about anything, but in every, be in prayer about everything. Um, with prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Jesus. That's right. our time of confession now. Just a time where we sit before the Lord, get quiet, confess our sin to Him. We're taking the Lord's Supper here in a little bit, so it's good. It's good to think about what Christ has done for us. Think about His sacrifice on the cross, His body broken, His blood poured out. Um, but in light of that, it's good to confess our sin to Him. And I say this kind of every time, but it's not for it's not for His benefit. It's not to let Him know something that He does not know. No, but it's for our benefit to show our reliance upon Him. So let's do that. Let's sit quietly before the Lord, confess our sins to Him, and then I'll close us with some prayer. short this week. I've been selfish, wanting to do what I want to do rather than putting others' needs before those, myself. Lord, we've fallen short in, in so many areas this week, in so many ways, so many times. But we are also thankful. We're thankful for Jesus and for His perfect life that we could not live, that we couldn't live for, for a day. should have been us. He took upon our cross and died on it. But not only did he die, Lord, but we're thankful that he rose from the grave. He defeated sin. He defeated death. And we know that we can trust that. Trust that he did that for us and we can be saved and we can know you and we can have a relationship with you and we can approach you boldly as we do now as we confess our sins. We are so, so thankful to be able to come straight to you. Not to have to go through someone else or pray to someone else, but we can approach you, God the Father, boldly. We are so thankful for that, Father. We love you. We praise you. We ask that you help us to worship you rightly. To, to act rightly. To, to bring glory to your name in the, the way that we do everything. Send we pray. Amen. Last thing I want to do, I just want to, as crazy as it comes up, I just want to introduce to you uh, Mike and Judy Van Slot down here. We're so excited to have them here this morning. Pastor Mike's going to be teaching for us this morning, Genesis 1 and 1. He's going to intro our, our Genesis series, and so we're so glad to have them here. They served at Fellowship Oshawa. We spent some time with them this past summer. It was a lot of fun, a lot of fun. We we actually played so much spike ball in their backyard that it turned to dirt and no more grass. And despite that, they have still come to worship with us this morning. So we're thankful to have them. Y'all go ahead and stand. Um, we've been learning last week um, from Philippians 4. Paul said, I, I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I've learned the secret of being filled and going hungry. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And that's what we're going to be um, praying for this morning. The Lord will teach us how to our heart is contentment as we rest in Him. And these songs, they 
give me Jesus. Um, you can have this whole world, but give me Jesus. In the
Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. And he established them forever and ever. He gave a decree and it shall not pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures in all deeps, fire and hail, snow and mist, stormy wind, fulfilling his word. Mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, beasts and all livestock, creeping things and flying birds, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth, young men and maidens together, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His majesty is above heaven and earth.
Good morning. I have a new love for spike ball. Morgan mentioned that um, our backyard took a bit of a beating, and uh, and yet um, I shared last night that um, <laughs> that my wife and I came into the backyard after everybody had headed for home, and <laughs> yes, there's a ring where they were pre playing pretty hard, and they were fully committed, that's for sure, but we looked at it, and some, some might be annoyed or whatever at the state of the lawn. We looked at it and said, that to us was just a picture of the love of Christ that a bunch of people had for the lost, and they came at their own expense, and expended their time and their energy, and those guys, especially kids, they just went hard for those days and loved on those kids, and most of them were napping in the afternoon because they'd given it their all in the morning, um, but we just loved having your people in Oshawa and just wanted to say thank you uh, from our church to yours for your investment in the work uh, in Oshawa, Ontario, Canada. Um, yeah. We love them. Um, we love your people, and we are so grateful to have them with us. It was a huge blessing. We both stood there and said, it's so quiet. We miss them already. 
We're going to be looking in uh, Genesis right at the very start, and uh, today's sermon is going to be maybe a little bit different. It's a privilege for me to preach this introduction. Uh, I got to preach this introduction at our own church because we started this study in Genesis back in January, and we're about halfway through. I preached Genesis 24 on August 25th, just before we headed south, and um, uh, you guys are in for a ride. It is it is incredible. It's such a great study. There's so much to learn, so much that's encouraging to us. And what I'm hoping to do this morning uh, is just kind of give you a taste of the beginning of this, but it, before I do so, I want to spend some time and just give you uh, a view of the panorama of Scripture of which this is the first book. And I'm hoping that you walk away with hearts just filled with the glory and the majesty of the Bible because it's written by the glorious, majestic God that we serve. Uh, and that's, that's my prayer this morning. <laughs> and it's convicted me as I've, as I've done this study, as we've walked our way through, it's convicted me that I am a man of feeble mind and stammering lips. So I'm just wondering if we could just take a moment again and ask God's help as we go through this, as I bring these, uh, these words from the Lord to you. Heavenly Father, your word is said to be living and powerful. It is majestic and awesome in its message because in it, and through it, you reveal yourself to us, and you are majestic and awesome. This morning, I publicly confess that on my own, I am completely incapable of doing your word justice. I need you, Lord. I need your Holy Spirit working and speaking through me to impact the hearts and souls of the hearers today. So, Holy Spirit, do your work in us today. Speak to us through your word and thereby shape and change us accordingly for your glory and for our good. Amen. I just want to mention that today's sermon will be structured a little bit differently. It's going to be a pretty significant introduction, if you will, uh, and we're only going to get a chance to look at one verse uh, this morning in Genesis. Um, it may also feel a little bit like a Bible college class, um, but if you, are, if you are sharing your faith with others, you may find that some of this information that I, that I bring out today might be really helpful for you to have uh, in a consolidated form. I gave um, uh, some little sermon outlines. If you are a note taker, you might find that helpful, but you're, there's no obligation, of course, to do so. When we first get saved, it's because the Holy Spirit, possibly through some believing friend uh, or preacher, or even just through reading the Word of God, declares the gospel to us, and we come to recognize it for the first time. He convicts us of our sin and introduces us to a Savior, the Son of God, Jesus the Christ. And so it's very common for us to want to start our studies there, to start with the parts about Jesus. And so we frequently dive into the gospels first. We did exactly that at Fellowship Oshawa. When I first came on as, as pastor there, we started a study in Matthew, and it was excellent, and I learned a lot through that study. For someone that's newly saved, however, some of what Jesus might have said or did or referred to might not have made much sense, because the gospel, God's news, good news of redemption, is a really big story that doesn't begin in Matthew. It begins at the beginning, in Genesis. The story of God's redemption of mankind, however, isn't found in Genesis. It's only introduced there. It is such a big story, such a glorious story, that it requires the entire panorama of the Bible to fully uh, reveal. So let's take a look and say, what is the Bible? It's a book, obviously, but it's a book made of 66 other smaller books of varying size, and these books were written down over a period of about 1,500 years on three different continents by about 40 different human authors. These authors came from various different walks of life. They were politicians and farmers and royal advisors, shepherds and kings, fishermen and tax collectors. They wrote in different genres. We get history and narrative, poetry and prophecy. But these 66 books 
form one very remarkable book because they combine to tell one continuous story. It is God's story. 2 Timothy 3.16 tells us that all Scripture is breathed out by God. It's the progressive revealing of God's redemptive plan for mankind. And as it's revealed, so is God's nature, God's character, and God's very tender heart of love for man, His creation. So here's the overview or the synopsis or the spoiler, if you will. God creates everything with the creation of mankind at the pinnacle. He's the masterpiece of his creation. And God lovingly and graciously provides everything for him. But mankind rebels against him and falls under his judgment, which is death. Now, all of that occurs in the first three chapters of the Bible. Incapable of rescuing themselves... The rest of the story details how God progressively, in his own time and his own way, enacts his eternal plan to redeem his rebellious creation at his own cost for his glory. The Bible, as most of you know, is divided into two portions. There's the Old Testament, which, is, which consists of 39 books which in a nutshell describe God's dealings with mankind in general, starting with Adam. Now, Adam, as steward of God's creation, is meant to do the following. He is meant to worship and obey God and display His glory to the world. But instead of worshiping God, Adam worships his own desires. Instead of obeying, Adam rebels. Instead of seeking God's glory, Adam seeks his own. And yet, God's redemptive plan is not derailed. God's plan continues through a man named Abraham and through his descendants who eventually become the nation Israel. Israel is intended to be the nation that would worship and obey God and display his glory to the world. (laughs) But, sounds familiar, doesn't it? Instead of worshiping God, they worship false gods. Instead of obeying, they rebel. Instead of seeking God's glory, Israel seeks their own glory, demonstrating the reality of the sin nature in them that was inherited from Adam. Yet, through Abraham and the nation Israel, God would provide the person who would do perfectly what Adam and Israel failed to do. He would perfectly worship and perfectly obey God and perfectly display His glory to the world. The Old Testament covers the story up to the arrival of this person, and it ends like a season finale cliffhanger. The nation of Israel is troubled, and they're in trouble. (laughs) They're looking for the Messiah, this rescuer, this redeemer that God promised to provide all throughout their history. And the Old Testament ends with God, because it's his story, remember, with God giving both a warning and a promise. And he he says this, For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name... The sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall. And you shall tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and rules that I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land 
with a decree of utter destruction. So, the Old Testament is the account of God's story up to the first coming of the Redeemer of rebellious mankind. And then we get the second portion, the New Testament. It's 27 books, and they detail the first coming of the Redeemer, who, as we well know, is none other than God's own Son. And we are awestruck by the realization that not only is God directing history and politics and culture and time as He writes His story, but God enters the story Himself as the hero, as the Redeemer, the infinite, eternal God enters the womb of a woman, wraps himself in human flesh. We call this the incarnation. And he is born as a helpless infant among the very people he came to redeem so that he could be, as Matthew records, Emmanuel, God with us. The God of the Bible is powerfully present. Paul, however, in his letter to the Corinthians, refers to Jesus as the last Adam. Jesus comes as the righteous representative of mankind. He achieves what Adam and the rest of the human race have continually failed to do. He perfectly worships and obeys God and perfectly displays His glory to the world. And this makes him qualified to be the acceptable substitute or sacrifice on mankind's behalf. Fully God and yet fully man so that he could suffer the punishment that we earned for our rebellion, so that he could die the death that we deserved for our staggering offense against holy God, the Creator. (laughs) And after his death, He arose from the grave demonstrating the validity of His sacrifice on our behalf and His perfect satisfaction of God's justice and holiness against our sin. By doing so, He has redeemed a people, a people not born of the right human ancestry or genealogy, but born again, born of the Spirit. As Jesus said to Nicodemus in John 3, verses 5 and 6, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. The New Testament begins with the miraculous arrival of God's Redeemer to earth the first time, and then describes the developing of this new entity that is created of the Spirit, which is called the church. And it contains men and women, boys and girls, who have been called by God from all peoples and nations because it's a spiritual entity into which, to which one gains entry only by God's grace through faith. So the books of the New Testament deal primarily with the life and reality and testimony of this church as it exists on earth after Christ's return to heaven. This is the part of the story in which we presently find ourselves, brothers and sisters. Now, once again, what's our role? Our role is to worship and obey God and to display His glory to the world. Can I get an amen? Yeah. And the story continues toward the conclusion where Jesus Christ returns, the conquering King, to claim His rightful position as King of kings and Lord of lords. We were singing that just before I got up here. He will punish wickedness. He will eliminate sin and death, and sorrow. His kingdom will have full dominion. And under His rule, He will be worshipped and obeyed, and His glory will be displayed forever and ever. Man, is that not the most majestic and inspiring story ever? 
But now I want to ask you a question in light of all of this, in light of the overview of the whole story of the Bible, in light of the overview of all of history, and that's this. How would you want the record of your part in God's story to read? If, as I mentioned just a minute ago, your part in the story is as a redeemed member of Jesus' glorious church, and your role is to worship and obey God and display His glory to the world, then how would you want that to read? If God is writing the account down somewhere, do you want the record to be of your dismal failure? Or do you want it to read that you are faithful, faithful to worship Him and obey Him, faithful to display His glory to the world around you? You cannot be successful in this in your own strength and determination. I don't know about you, but my resolve tends to be pretty weak most of the time. Frankly, it sucks. But as a community, as a church body, We can encourage one another to fulfill our role. We need each other. We were created to be in community. We can encourage and invite accountability and fellowship and discipleship and devotion. On Sundays, you can come here and you can worship together with other brothers and sisters. You can receive encouragement and teaching and exhortation and instruction inspiration from the Word being publicly read and taught in this place so that you can go and obey God each day of your life and thereby display His glory to the world. So now that we've got the overview, the thousand-foot view, if you will, let's move to the beginning of the story and start to consider some of the details I guarantee that it will cause you to marvel all over again. Let's take a look at the book of Genesis. What is this book? Like any coherent worldview, Genesis addresses a very important question. Why is there something rather than nothing? In the book of Genesis, we're going to find out why there is something rather than nothing, what there is, how it came to be, who put it there, And why? For what purpose? Genesis means beginnings. But Genesis isn't just about the beginning of the world as we know it. It's about the beginning of a number of things. The beginning of mankind. The beginning of relationships. The beginning of marriage and sexuality. Family and children. Government. And it tells us exactly why the world that we live in today is in the absolute mess that it's in. Not only that, but it reveals to us why we are the mess that we are. But before we get ahead of ourselves, let's address a few details. So the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, are called the Pentateuch which means five scrolls. These five books are all connected and they form one record. As you come to the end of Genesis and start the beginning of Exodus, it's very obvious that this is a continuing saga, right? Uh, So they're all connected and they form one record, kind of like the story of the Lord of the Rings, right? It's three books, the Fellowship of the Ring, the Two Towers, the Return of the King. I'm a bit of a fan. Each book of the Pentateuch starts where the last one left off. The Pentateuch was Israel's first inspired body of Scripture. For many years, it was Israel's only Bible, I say that in quotes, Jewish people commonly referred to it as the Torah or the law. Remember when the lawyer asked Jesus what the greatest commandment was in Matthew? And Jesus, in Matthew 22, 37 to 40, he responds, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. And that's how they refer to the Old Testament, generally speaking, the law and the prophets, two bunches of writings. 
So the law refers to the Pentateuch, and the prophets is a general term that relates to the rest of what we describe as the Old Testament. Now, though it isn't recorded in the Pentateuch itself, the Old and New Testament authors refer to Moses as the author of those first five books. They're sometimes referred to as the books of Moses. Being trained and educated as a son of Pharaoh, Moses would have been a natural candidate for authoring this first written record. So that puts the date of writing at approximately 1445 B.C. It's also important for us to consider the audience as well. Moses is obviously writing to the nation of Israel, but not as a nation in its own land yet. Moses is writing to a people who are wandering in the wilderness. They have no home yet. Moses is writing to a people whose entire surrounding culture has, since the day they were born, hammered home the message to them that they are worthless and despised because they're not Egyptian. They are good for nothing but being slaves. Slaves of Egypt's pharaoh, expendable manual laborers with no inherent value and no rights, whose lives are of no worth. For 400 years, this has been their reality. And that external message has slowly but surely been internalized. Even they have a hard time thinking about themselves as anything but slaves. And so God is in the process through this book as Moses writes it and then reads it to the people. And we've been learning that recently, that this was, they were an oral culture. So these were stories that were intended to be told and heard and memorized and recounted because most people didn't read and write. And so Moses, or God through Moses, is in the process of retraining the thinking and reshaping the mindset of this people in preparation for them to go into the promised land. He's got to undo all the mental stuff that they've been picking up from the Egyptian culture around them and reshape that. So let's take a look at the start of this amazing and awe-inspiring message to them. And it's also to us, right? Paul reminds us that these things were written for our instruction. So there's much that we need to learn from this as well. Turn, if you would, please, to the very beginning of the Bible, Genesis 1, verse 1. And as we do so, I encourage you to just quiet in your spirit and absorb the profound majesty of these very few words. Genesis 1, 1 says this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Ten words, I believe. Powerful words. Let's keep this thought at the forefront as we go through this. The God of the Bible is both eternally existent and powerfully present. Eternally existent and powerfully present. So the first thing that we get out of this one verse is this. God is uncreated. God is uncreated. The passage begins with these profound words, in the beginning, God. But that automatically begs a question, the beginning of what? I mean, typically, a beginning refers to the start of a time period, like the start of a race, the start of a day. Uh, it's the beginning of the time period, for example, when the race for which the race lasts, it implies that there will be an end to that race as well, beginning and an end. But when we're discussing the beginning, we're typically talking about the time period when everything starts. And lo and behold, God's already there. We are time-bound creatures. We struggle to deal with the concepts of beyond time or measureless amounts of time. I taught high school mathematics for 30 years, was specifically hired to be the calculus specialist. And one of the things that we do in the study of calculus is we try and grasp a concept of the infinite, but we've got finite minds, so it's a challenge. 
And if you've wrestled with calculus, you might understand that challenge. I enjoyed it. I thought it was fascinating. But we struggle. We struggle with these things. Here in the very first words of the Bible, we are confronted with a God who is infinite, a God who is beyond, a God who is outside of the limitations of our time-bound understanding. Praise God for that. I'm glad that the God we serve is bigger than my mind is able to get a hold of. Because if I could fully understand that, then he wouldn't be God. (laughs) Moses doesn't try to explain him or rationalize him or justify him. He simply addresses God's eternal existence as fact. But you need to understand that Moses is also proclaiming to these former slaves of Egypt that God, their Redeemer God, the God of the Bible, he isn't like the gods of the Egyptians. He didn't originate out of what was there. He was there before there was anything else. He is eternal. You see, the Egyptian gods weren't like that. If you read the Egyptian um, creation stories, the gods came out of the mud and the water and the things that were already there. That's where they uh, originated from. God is the God of the Bible, is completely other. There's another famous passage of Scripture that begins with the phrase, in the beginning. It's found in the Gospel of John. John's Gospel begins with those words, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And as we continue to read the passage, it tells us that the Word became flesh, and dwelt among us. So, when did God become flesh and dwell among us? Why, in the person of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So, there is a person who is referred to as the Word, who turns out to be Jesus, who is stated to be God, and therefore, it should be no surprise that we see the same attributes of infinity and eternality attributed to Jesus because he was in the beginning with God. And back to Genesis 1. The word that we translate as God in this passage, the original word is Elohim. And Elohim is an interesting word because it's a plural rather than a singular word. The singular form of that word Elohim is El. And we see it in a lot of Jewish words and place names. For example, there is a city in Israel called Bethel, or Beth-el, which means the house of God. For clarity in English, we often use the word Godhead when we're translating this term, like Paul does in Colossians, so that it's clear that there's a plurality to the person of God described here. Now, if you move ahead to verse 26 in Genesis chapter 1, then you read there that says, then God said, let us make man in our image. Now, that grammar would be completely wrong if God was singular. So, not only is Moses communicating that God is eternal, But there's a plurality to the Godhead. The Egyptian gods, with which the Israelites would have been so familiar, had absolutely nothing like this. And that's the point. Moses is establishing the God of the Bible as completely other than any of the gods the people knew. So God is eternal. God is plural. Next, in the second half of this verse, we are learning that God is the creator. God is the one who brought it all to bear. The verse continues in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So while God himself is uncreated, he is the creator and source of all the created things. And in what amounts to 10 simple words in English, Moses ascribes power and majesty and greatness to this God. He alone has brought everything, everything into existence. 
John 1 verse 3 tells us, all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Now, recall that the him in John 1 is the word whom we know to be Jesus. So, Jesus was the person of the Godhead who did the creating. Everything was created by him. Nothing was created that wasn't created by him. John is very clear to express it in both the positive and the negative. He says everything was created by him, and then nothing was created that wasn't created by him. Let's just make this clear, all-encompassing, right? So when we look at the creation around us, who is the creator that the creation is simply pointing us to? It's Jesus. That's where the glory belongs. He gets the credit for that. One last passage before we wrap up. Hebrews 1, verses 1 to 3, and and it's up here on the screen, I believe. We read, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, He's spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things, through whom also He created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature, and He upholds the universe by the word of His power. Man, I hope that gives you goosebumps like it does me. This passage, again, in Hebrews, like the passage in John, reinforces this truth. Jesus, the Redeemer, is Jesus, the Creator. He is the second person of the Godhead, and so He is eternally existent. And as the Creator and the Sustainer, He is also powerfully present. Brothers and sisters, just like the world of the Israelites, our world is full of messages that you are nothing if you don't measure up to some predetermined image. If you don't think that's, it, it's that bad, people ask your kids. Ask your kids how hard it is these days in schools and the comparisons If you aren't this or that, if you don't do this or that, or say this or that, or have this or that, then socially, you're an outcast. If you don't have that phone, or you're not athletic, or you're not pretty, or you don't go to the parties, or whatever, then in this world's estimation, you don't have worth, and you don't belong. But God's message transcends civilizations and cultures and artificial value systems because it comes from God and God is outside of time. He is eternally existent and therefore His message is eternally true as well. God's word is as true today as it was in the beginning. He still tells us that we have inherent value and worth because He made us in His image. We need to remember that. We need to cling to that. Given what we've been reminded of this morning regarding the majestic and awesome story of the gospel, the redemptive plan of a majestic and awesome God who loves rebellious sinners like us and has made us part of His glorious church through the perfect work of His Son, Jesus, on the cross, I ask you again, How would you want the record of your part in God's story to read? How will your life be different because of what God has shown you today? How will the truth of who God is and what He's done to make you what you are today change how you're going to live your life? What will you choose to stop doing or start doing or do differently or do better? How will this truth impact your boldness for the gospel, your discipline regarding prayer and Bible reading, your selflessness towards your spouse or your family or your church or your neighbors? I pray, brothers and sisters, that our vision of our eternally existent and powerfully present God revolutionizes how we see ourselves and our part in God's great story of His redemptive plan. Let's pray. God, we confess 
that we are people that are so easily distracted, so easily discouraged, so easily selfish and self-focused. And we need your word to remind us of who we are and more importantly, who you are and the part that you've called us to play in your great story of redemption, this, this Bible, this word of yours. God, we recognize that our task is to worship you and to obey you and display your glory to the world. And so we just recognize that we're not much good at doing that on our own. We just ask that you would give more of your Holy Spirit, that you would encourage us more and more to be devoted to that, that we would glorify you in all that we do, that you would shine out from our lives, and that people would be drawn to you because they've met us. Father, we just pray that we would be faithful and pleasing to you for your glory and for our good. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor Mike, I appreciate you bringing to our attention just the context of Genesis 1. I just reminded of all that Moses wrote and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. All he wrote is in the context of these Israelites coming out of Egypt and being all they knew was these Egyptian gods and, and us being able to understand who God is in light of that thankful for that brother we've had a, we had a great time uh, last few days visiting with them uh, i know you want to many of you want to talk to them afterwards we had a, our missions team met with them last night and had dinner and caught up on just uh, their work and they'll be sending us uh, videos and they'll keep us up to date on what's going on with their work there in oshawa and look forward to lord willing being able to go back next summer and work with them i want to read something for you. It's first Sunday. We had a great time. We had a big breakfast this morning, and I appreciate you men that cooked for that. And Charles Garner taught us about William Carey, introduced us to him and uh, how we could um, benefit, we how we have benefited from his work, uh, his kingdom work, and, and how we can emulate him. I appreciate you doing that, brother. Um, it's always a good time, first Sunday of the month. But we also take the Lord's Supper, and so... Uh, we're going to do that. I want to read something uh, out of the scriptures for you, uh, out of John 6, just thinking about the Lord's Supper. And uh, If you remember the Last Supper when Jesus instituted this and, and taught the apostles how to do this, how to take the Lord's Supper and, and commanded them to do that until he returns. So we're in the middle of this church age where we're taking the Lord's Supper and us as a, a church we take it once a month and it's a time for us to remember what Christ has done for us if you remember the the Last Supper they're celebrating the Passover and Jesus had his disciples with them and we'll read that text in just a moment out of Matthew but I want to read it out of John chapter 6 Jesus had turned a few fish and a few loaves into a buffet and 5,000 men not including women and kids were fed that day he fed 5,000 people with very little and so as a result of that people began to follow Jesus and he says truly truly I say to you whoever believes has eternal life I am the bread of life your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died this is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Now, think about that. He's speaking his words to a group of people, many of which he knew their hearts. And he knew that they didn't um, embrace him as Savior. They were following him because they liked the bread, the physical bread that he gave them. They wanted to see the miracles. They wanted to benefit from that. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, 
how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Pretty bizarre. Talking about eating, Jesus says, eat, eating my flesh and drinking my blood. Kind of bizarre, isn't it? So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh... And drinks my blood, abides in me, and I in him. Jesus is kind of laying on thick, isn't he? You think this is bizarre? Okay, here we go. As the living Father sent me, I live because of the Father. So whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. These are folks who were following him because they, they wanted physical benefit from it. They want to see the miracles. But Jesus knew their heart. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught at Capernaum. If you're familiar with that chapter in John 6, 66, what did it say as a result of him teaching these things? Yeah, what did the crowds do? They left him. They abandoned him. Who can embrace this crazy teaching? What's Jesus doing here? Eat my flesh and drink my blood. Matthew 26, they're in the upper room celebrating the Passover. And Jesus says to to his disciples... He took the bread and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I'll tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. And so, what's Jesus doing here? He's doing the same thing you eat my flesh you drink my blood you have eternal life here take it this is my body took the cup drink of it this is the blood of the covenant what's he doing saying if you embrace me you'll have life he's talking about faith he's not talking about physical he's talking about faith and If you embrace Christ as Lord and Savior, you'll have life, eternal life, spiritual life. And so we we take the the Lord's Supper, and how we do that is um, it's like a family meal. And and if you're here and you're visiting with us, you don't have to be a part of our church to take the, the Lord's Supper. We invite you, if you're a believer and you've been baptized and you've trusted Christ, as Savior and Lord, we encourage you to take the Lord's Supper. And, and I know how that happens. Sometimes you're like, maybe you're visiting with us, and you're like, man, I haven't been really living rightly, and I don't think I need to take the Lord's Supper because I'm not really worthy, and you know, I'm just not right with the Lord. Well, the Lord doesn't really give you an option if you're a believer. He says, take it. And if you read 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he says, we do this in remembrance of me. So if you're in that situation and you just hadn't been living right and you hadn't been living for God's glory, you hadn't been obeying the Lord, you haven't been emulating Christ hardly at all, then repent and then take the Lord's Supper. If you're not a a child of God, if you're not a part of the kingdom, if you're not a disciple of Jesus, if you've never repented and trusted Christ, then I would encourage you not to take the Lord's Supper. Just watch and learn. But if you're a believer, you've repented and you've trusted Christ, then you take the Lord's Supper today because you have been redeemed. You've been blessed by the body of Christ. It was broken for you on the cross. You've been blessed by the blood of Jesus that makes us white as snow. So you take the Lord's Supper today, okay? And how this is going to happen, we're going to 
have a time of prayer. We've already had a time of confession. We're going to pray. Paul says that we should examine ourselves. And that's pretty serious. This isn't a play time, a talking time. A, no, it's a serious time in the life of the church. In Corinth, there were some people that were just flippantly taking the Lord's Supper, and they were getting sick. <laughs> so much so that they were dying. You say, well, Pastor, if I take the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner, you think God's going to strike me dead? I don't know. In Corinth, the people died. So we need to put a fence around it, don't we? Let's take the Lord's Supper in a worthy manner, if you're a believer. You're going to come up, and I'm going to have the elements here. Take a, take a piece of bread and take a cup and go back to your seat. And, and when you're ready, you take that. You eat the bread. But when you do, when you eat the bread, we be thankful for Jesus' body that was broken for you. And then you take the cup and you drink it, being thankful for his blood shed for you. We're here today to worship. We can do that because Christ worked. His life lived, his death and his resurrection. We can approach the Father. We can worship and celebrate and draw near to him because of what Christ has done. So today we remember that and we celebrate it. So I'll encourage you to do that. So we're going to pray. And as you're ready, you just come up and grab a piece of bread and grab a cup and you can go back to your seat. And when you're ready, you eat that and you drink that and remembrance of what Christ has done and then we'll close out our service here in a, in, a, in a few minutes okay let's just sit before the Lord examining ourselves and confessing sin and repenting of sin and Father, bring to our remembrance those things that displease you, that dishonor you, an attitude, a word spoken. Maybe it's uh, something that we should have done that we didn't. Maybe it's laziness. Bring those things to our attention and we can confess those. Come when you're ready, remembering his body broken and his bloodshed.
that's a good way to end our morning, isn't it? Focusing on Christ. It's always a somber thing, but it's always an empowering exercise as well. And I'm going to ask the praise team, come on up. We're going to sing our benediction. I'm just going to give you a couple of announcements. Um, it's the first Sunday, so Tuesday is the first Tuesday. So ladies, uh, come and participate if you're uh, available. The prayer and share here at the Family Life Center um, at 11 a.m. Bring a, a friend if you'd like and a dish to share. Uh, we are back on Wednesday nights. We started last Wednesday. Sweet time, wasn't it, just to be together. If I had to do over again, we wouldn't have studied. We would have just been together. It was just real sweet. So uh, come if you missed last Wednesday, we'll catch you up. We just started a um, study on conflict management. Anybody in, you have conflict ever? Um, yeah, we all do. So we're learning this semester just how to deal with conflict um, within the church, within the home, within the workplace. So we'll uh, be studying the adults and the students are studying idolatry and how to um, obey the first and second commands. The kids have things going on. So Wednesday night, 6 to 8, we'll eat and uh, excited about that. So come on Wednesday night if you're available. The ladies' fall gathering is October the 18th. There's a sign-up sheet in the, in the foyer, and uh, that same weekend we'll have our men's retreat um, the 18th through the 20th. So just be mindful of that. Put that on your calendar. Uh, really excited about the video that uh, Nicku sent. He sent it yesterday, but uh, I'll sh- we'll show it next week of camp. They had um, 123 kids that came to camp those two weeks, and so we'll have a video we'll show you next week. But they had a great couple of weeks. That's what our money goes to that we take up on Wednesday night. So uh, we'll share that next week. But let's stand and let's sing, have our benediction. It is uh, so good. Um, to see you. We have a lot of people traveling, so be in prayer for those folks as they play and as they travel back home tomorrow afternoon. Quite a few folks are out, but it is uh, good to see you all. Uh, Chapel, it's really good to see you. And Smith's here. Uh, Glad to see y'all. Chapel's been peddling drugs uh, uh, this week. Uh, Yeah, yeah, I was going to say that. I was going to say that. Uh, She's a pharmacist, and she's been working for Brent as Brent's out of town, so it's good to Good to have, have you here. Make sure you speak to chapel. But let's sing and we'll be dismissed. Just go.